wir alle wissen immer wieder oder hören immer wieder Namen über Unternehmen wie Uber, Google, Amazon und so weiter. Und eine Person, die in diesen Entwicklungen immer ganz tief drin steckt, das ist der Jan. Hallo ähm, Jan. Ja. Und äh, Jan ist äh, Gründer und CEO der Academy for Corporate Entrepreneurship und er ist Director vom Founder Institut, dem weltweit größten Accelerator Programm, das bereits über 1850 Firmen hat entstehen lassen und äh, hat also sehr, sehr viel Erfahrung damit. Und er wird uns einen spannenden, spannenden Vortrag erzählen über das Thema Innovation, Veränderung, Unternehmen. Und äh, ja, ich freue mich auf den Vortrag. Danke, Jan. Danke, Jakob. Um, what Jakob didn't mention was, this will be in English. So I hope that's okay for everyone. For you guys at the back, if you still want to come forward, there's lots of space here. Um, I think this is my first time giving a talk like this in a bar. It's a pretty cool setting. Um, it will be about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and we'll have a bit of time for Q&A. To begin with, Jakob asked me to um, tell some jokes, which I thought would be pretty interesting with a primarily German audience and talking about innovation. But being half British, half German, uh, I thought we might try one. So what do you get when you're thinking about digitalization and Steve Jobs while sitting on the toilet? Anyone? A pretty cool toilet roll holder with MP3 player. And unfortunately, the world is full of such innovations, right? Um, pretty useless. No one's going to really buy it. Uh, whoever developed this will not last very long. And I really want to explore this topic in a bit more detail with you guys. Um, I'm very focused on entrepreneurship, which is really bringing entrepreneurship from the outside world and bringing it inside large established organizations. So it is literally the act of behaving like an entrepreneur within a large organization. But this is not a new topic. It's been around since the 1700s, um, the father of modern day economics, Adam Smith, spoke about this. Uh, about having entrepreneurial employees in order to gain competitive advantage, okay? But the topic is becoming uh, hot again, I guess, and, and becoming a necessity. So what is driving that? And a big part of this is speed of innovation. And I'm sure you're going to talk a lot about digitalization over the next few days and innovation. But I just want to highlight what's been happening. It took HP 20 years to become a billion dollar company. Right? Microsoft then managed to do it in 10 years, Dell in seven, Amazon in four, two years, Instagram became a billion dollar company. Does anyone know the fastest company to become a billion dollar company? Uber, good guess, but no. Airbnb, also not. A company called Slack achieved a billion dollars within eight months. Okay, so speed of innovation, speed of creating value from nothing is increasing dramatically. Slack, by the way, is a, um, uh, it's like a, a team project management tool, um, uh, taking messaging back to its basics and sharing documents with each other. Now, the unicorn is a private billion dollar company that is not yet listed on a stock exchange. And right now, as of a few months ago, we have 176 unicorns in the club, which used to be exclusive. Someone mentioned Airbnb and Uber. This is when Airbnb got founded, 2011. Um, and since then, we can see how many more unicorns are joining the club. And what's happening with existing companies? Maybe a lot of you here tonight are working for the listed companies that are Fortune 500 or on the S&P 500. The average lifespan of these companies is drastically declining faster and faster to the point where we're saying that 75% of the current S&P will be gone by 2027, replaced by a lot of these unicorn companies, okay? So that's what's happening. Here's some of the brands on the left. 
uh, that have recently joined the S&P 500 and the brands on the right have not been able to adapt fast enough, are not significant anymore in today's marketplace, and therefore they're dropping from the list. There's lots of statistics like this now on the internet. 67 startups making your home smarter. Maybe this is relevant for your industry. Um, startups are just looking for a niche way of offering a new value proposition and getting into existing markets that are dominated by large players. Oh, not working. Here's another one that I like. Um, Disruption doesn't have to just take away your entire company because of technological change. But if you think of a company like Procter & Gamble that has multiple revenue streams, there's this notion of death by a thousand cuts. Okay? It's not like Netflix getting rid of Blockbuster because they weren't able to adapt entirely. Um, but you might come under threat in many different areas. And one example here is a small company that started out as Dollar Shave Club. One person had the idea to send razor blades in the post and you could reorder them using a monthly subscription to save you going to the drugstore, um, finding the person that has the key to that magic cabinet, right? Or taking the card in uh, Rossman and taking it to the counter and saying, I want to buy some razor blades. It's a bit of an annoying process. This company, Dollar Shave Club, two months ago, got purchased by Unilever for $1 billion. The funny thing is that Unilever was never in the razor blade business, but P&G was. So now it's become P&G's biggest, uh, biggest competitor because P&G ignored multiple opportunities to A, buy this company, and B, adopt the idea of selling razor blades using subscription models. So it's very important for established companies to understand what startups are up to and to even start developing new ideas by themselves. You can find a slide like this for any company. Let's take Honeywell as an example. Here's a bunch of startups that are attacking from the outside. So I urge you, if you're in a big company, find the startups that are potentially attacking your market share or the opportunities that your company could be going into tomorrow. So with that, I have a question. Let's make this a little bit interactive. What is Silicon Valley? Who wants to give me an answer? What do you think of when you think of Silicon Valley? Do you have something? No? Well, it's an area in San Francisco where probably the most important um, development companies who are driving the whole world in front of them. Okay, great. So geographic region of importance where lots of startups are coming up. Anyone else? What do you think of? A synonym for innovation. Synonym for innovation. I like that. Silicon Valley is getting a lot of attention. And, and to the first point... It's where big companies believe they have to have incubators because incubators are going to solve all of your innovation problems. As long as you're in Silicon Valley with a lab or an incubator, you will become an innovative company. Right? Bullshit. That's not going to happen. People like this are getting a lot of attention, right? Silicon Valley, um, Larry Page, Steve Jobs. These guys are all growing quickly in Silicon Valley. Um, the media are picking up on it. It's not your, your CEO of a 50-year-old company that's making the, the cover of these types of magazines, but it's the new disruptive entrepreneurs. Zuckerberg as well, uh, the CEO of Airbnb, Brian Chesky, Uber CEO as well, Travis. And now, see, Silicon Valley, the notion of Silicon Valley is becoming so popular that even a TV show is being made out of it, right? It's being shown on HBO, and it means Silicon Valley and the idea behind Silicon Valley is becoming mainstream. Now, I believe Silicon Valley is the entrepreneurial mindset and skills which can be adopted anywhere. To me, it's not about the place. The place is not so important. We can bring Silicon Valley to the rest of the world, and we can bring Silicon Valley into your own organization. And behind those successful entrepreneurs, it's really the mindset and the skills, how they go about business and attacking new opportunities that is what is creating value at unprecedented speed. But for us entrepreneurs, 
it sometimes lo looks like this, right? You come up with a great idea, you see a problem that you want to solve, and the organization doesn't want to know. I'm sure you've probably all felt that. So to survive, we must adopt the entrepreneurial mindset and skills. And this is the, the entrepreneur's dilemma that we experience today. When you look at an organization, it, it really has two functions. You have to focus on execution activities. And this is what most of the organization has been designed and optimized to do since it first became successful, right? It was a startup, it grew to a big company, it got shareholders, and now it's all about efficiency. Let's milk that cash cow, right? How long can we keep the good times going? But what we did in the beginning was exploring. We explored new ideas, we explored new markets, we explored new opportunities. We invited our employees to come up with ideas. This is what the founders did in the very beginning. And in an established organization, all of the emphasis is on this cash cow, and we're not spending too much time looking at new ideas. And this is a real problem, because eventually, as I've already shown you, your market will change. Your customers will ask for something different. You will need new customers. So if you've designed this perfect organization that might be a cow and produces amazing milk, you're able to sell lots and lots of milk to the market. What happens when the market turns around, doesn't want milk anymore, and wants chickens? But you've got a cow that can only produce milk. Because I bet you never saw a cow that produced chickens. Right? Doesn't happen. You need a completely different organization for producing chickens. And we do not want to be stuck in that position. So the message is very clear. You have to innovate or your company will die. That's what history is telling us. So with that notion, I want to give you a few um, tips, if you like, a few steps based on, on um, a lot of my experience. I've been lucky to work with this guy called Adeo Resi. Um, he's the CEO and founder of an organization called the Founder Institute, which helps entrepreneurs go from idea to actually launching their startup company. And over the past eight years, we've developed $25 billion in, um, in new value. That's the valuation of the entire portfolio. So I want to reflect on this experience and reflect on our work with existing corporate organizations and uh, provide some insights. Step one is you have to have, or your management has to have the epiphany moment. Or in German, we can call this the Scheiser moment, right? When are you going to say, ach du Scheiser, and what are you saying it about? For us, um, we saw that in the startup world and with entrepreneurs, we saw that 90% of new ideas would fail. And this really bothered us because the Founder Institute was created during the financial crisis with the goal to create new jobs. In order to create new jobs, you have to create new, new revenue streams. You have to add value. Um, that's what would kickstart the economy, and I'm glad to say that over time we managed to turn that 90% failure rate into an 80% survival rate. Okay, and I'll give you some tips on how that happened. I was talking to a lady from ENBW uh, a while back, the energy company from Baden-Württemberg, and their Achtel Scheiser moment was when Atomkraft would no longer be available in Germany. Right? So they're thinking, shit. Our business isn't going to exist in the future as it had in the past. We need to now come up with new ways of making money. Otherwise, our company will considerably be downsizing. For the automobile industry, it may have been this, when Tesla made the news um, and actually generated $10 billion in pre-orders. I, I was one of them. I put money down to buy a car that I'd never seen, never test drove, never sat in, Yet I'm willing to pay money up front for something that I might get in two and a half years. And many people did that. So all the car companies are like, wow, how, how did that happen? And if we look at trucks, it might be this. This is the Tesla of, of the trucking industry, a company called Nikola, who are extending the range of trucks um, uh, by, by 100%. So this truck can travel twice as far 
um, and not even use um, any diesel. So here's another story from a company called Intuit. Uh, back in the 1980s, they were a startup financial software company, help you process your taxes, make the tax re return uh, a lot easier. I wish that would come to Germany. I don't think we have it here yet, um, but mostly an American product. So they had two successful products that led them to IPO. Uh, they're now a company with 30,000 people. They share the Google campus with Google in Silicon Valley. But the founder, Scott Cook, said, um, when, when the stock price was flatlining for a number of years, he realized we're not close enough to our customer like how we used to be. Um, before, when we were closer to the customer, we were understanding uh, the new opportunities and the value that we could bring. And he actually said, you know what, we've lost our innovation mojo. That's what made us good in the beginning. And as a result, he implemented a whole range of lean innovation and entrepreneurship related programs over time. And you can see the result, the stock price actually doubled over the following years. So, you know, I'm saying this and it's all very well and good, but it's pretty damn hard. It takes a special kind of person to stand up and say, you know, what got us here, what made us successful is not enough to get us to where we need to go. And my only advice I can give you is if your leadership are not recognizing that, if they're not having the Ach du Scheiße moment and they're not saying we need to change and you want to change in that organization, if you can't convince them, then probably you're going to have to leave and go somewhere else. Otherwise, you will become very frustrated. Okay, let's look at people and ideas. <clears throat> Over the past eight years, we've actually looked at 35,000 entrepreneurs, and we've been pretty, pretty anal about it. Um, we've worked with social scientists to understand what, what, what personalities of the entrepreneur makes the entrepreneur successful and how do we break down that personality. We find that the more successful people have common personality characteristics like high ability to solve problems. They tend to be more curious than other people. They're very socially intelligent. Um, especially for entrepreneurs, they have something that's called mannerliness. This is your ability to work with stakeholders inside the organization and push things through and even work with people that you do not like. Okay? Um, they have a high level of self-regard so they, they don't get put down very easily. They can box their way through and they tend to be very adaptive and um, can mold themselves into new situations. Now, the theory says that up to 15% of your organization could be potential entrepreneurs. And for me, that's a big aha moment because it means there's a lot of resources with your own employees where we can almost begin to replicate what startups are doing. We can do it inside with your own employees. Another very important point with, when forming teams in an organization is to not force it upon someone. Don't mandate that people should contribute to innovation. Try to self-select. Let the people that want to get involved come to you. Let them self-organize around problems that they think are important because this passion aspect, passion at the end of the day is the only thing that keeps an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur going. The more cross-functional a team can be, meaning you have different skill sets. So typically we say you have a hacker, a hustler, a designer, and a visionary. That means they can work very well together without putting a lot of strain on the rest of the organization. They can, they can work together in their, own little, in their own little world and get a lot of things done. And the reason why this is important, because look at history. Um, <clears throat> the founders of Intel were working at Fairchild Semiconductor, where the management at Fairchild wouldn't recognize the potential of Silicon Gate technology. Um, so Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce became very frustrated and they left. They bought the building across the street, started taking hundreds of the Fairchild employees with them and that's how Intel got founded. Steve Jobs and, and Wozniak, they tried to sell the idea of um, smaller computers to their employers. They were working at HP and at, at Atari 
but the employer didn't want to know, so they left. They founded Apple. This guy is um, Joe Tanner. He used to work at um, uh, he used to work at 3M. Um, no, sorry, Dupont. Dupont, the chemical company. And I don't know if any of you um, do outdoor activities or skiing, but he is the reason why we have Gore-Tex in our jackets. The previous company would not let him innovate because he didn't have an advanced degree. So he moved to Gore, where the culture was more open, and they didn't care about his de degree. They said, go and pursue your ideas and see what you come up with. And even Google is not immune to this. The founders of Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest were all at Google, became frustrated, decided to leave. Now, obviously, there will always be natural attrition. Some people will leave, but there's a big gray area of people that would like to be innovative, but with the security of their day job and their employer. I really like this quote by Lou Gerstner um, about his tenure as CEO at IBM. He talks about how he came to see that you know, culture isn't just one aspect of the game. Culture actually is the end game. Um, oops, sorry. Um, it, it, it's down to you know, your collective capacity of its people in order to create value. And that's what entrepreneurship really taps into. And today, this is more important than ever because in a few years, half of the workforce will be made up of millennials a whole different generation that want to work in a different way. And right now, if we talk to millennials, 70% of them who are in normal jobs are already saying they would prefer to quit and work for themselves. So if companies are going to hold on to the younger workforce, they need to be providing more entrepreneurial opportunities where they can take ownership. Okay, let's take a quick look at ideas. Um, over the years, we've actually explored 15,000 ideas, which led to 2,500 launches, new ventures being launched. And what we really try to get into the heads of these entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs is asking them and getting them to test, are you really solving a real problem for a real customer in a feasible way? Yeah. And if you can't do that, it's likely that the idea will fail, but we need to find out as soon as possible before we invest too much money and too much time. The other criteria we had was that new ideas had to have some relationship to technology so that they could actually be scalable because we're not talking about incremental innovation. We're not interested in doing what we did last year slightly better, but we're interested in finding new breakthrough products and new growth areas that will really contribute revenue. It's also very important when doing this inside an organization to align with a sponsor. It's no good just coming up with any idea. It has to solve a problem for an internal sponsor um, so that when it does need funding later, you can go back to that sponsor and they will, they will provide you funding for the actual development then of, of the solution. Okay? There's many ways to collect ideas. You can use software ideation platforms, um, have hackathon events, collaborate with startups, etc. <clears throat> okay, the third step is world-class structured curriculum. And I think this is what sets us out um, to all the rest. And, and mentoring, super important. <clears throat> so, look. If you think about the evolution of an idea, the very first stage, we come up with disruptive ideas. We then should be exploring them to find problem, solution, fit. Am I solving a real problem with this solution? And then I would go ahead and incubate the idea. Right? I would then actually work on developing the solution and can we develop the solution in a feasible way before going to launch. And what happens inside many large organizations is when managers are presented with new ideas because maybe they're digital and they seem all exciting, they say, wow, that looks really great. Go ahead and build it. See if you can build it. See if we can implement it. And we don't give enough due diligence to find out if the market, if the customer even wants it. Is it commercially viable? Can we make money from this idea? Um, so. The missing link in innovation today is often this notion of a discovery stage where we need to apply more of these search principles before we start executing on the solution. If we don't do that, 
That's where we get the 90% failure rate of all these innovative ideas. And they start rolling back down the slope into the valley of death, where potential good ideas went to die. <clears throat> now, this discovery phase can be done over a 12-week process by employees giving up as little as 10 hours a week if they are guided by curriculum and guided by mentors. Okay, so it's one day a week over 12 weeks, and you can make a lot of progress in that stage. Now, this thinking is very much in line with the world's greatest VCs. This is Mark Andreessen, who's invested in a lot of those billion-dollar companies you saw early, earlier. <clears throat> He's, he's saying, what questions can entrepreneurs and product managers ask to counter the sometimes wishful thinking and faulty assumption behind the belief that if we build it, they will come? Because that is often what we're trying to do. We believe if we build it and bring it to market, the customers will come. And that is often simply not true. So when we look at curriculum, we can break it down into steps that put the customer first. You need to have big, bold ideas and teams coming into the process they then undergo a kickoff stage where they're physically working with mentors and they get out of the building to go and test some of their assumptions on real customers from day one. Then they can enter a 12-week accelerator process where they're asking themselves, you know, is, are we exploring the problem well enough? Can we come up with a solution? Then we're applying design thinking, lean startup, sales and marketing, all the best methodologies from Silicon Valley that these entrepreneurs are applying in their businesses, we can apply to internal ideas as well to help validate. Now, the result of pushing people through this process has been that 45% of the ideas actually get funded. They get sponsored. Um, and I can tell you the average amount of funding is $250,000. So it's not a, not a small amount. And because of that process, 80% of those ideas then go on to survive. Okay, now once we've done all that, we want to make it scalable so it can have an impact in the company. So you can use a train-the-trainer approach. It's, it's not good to transform the company overnight. That doesn't happen. You have to start small with some core teams, train them, and then train them on how to train other people. And this is what companies like GE and Intuit have been doing. They've been developing their own army of innovation catalysts. And you've got to ask yourself, what if 15% of staff were meaningfully able to contribute to innovation? Would your company look different as a result? We've managed to scale to 120 locations where we're now developing 1,000 ideas per year, with 80% of those going on to be successful. And the result of all of this is really a culture of innovation. Two things happen inside an organization. The first thing is you start engaging your employees, especially the talent that want to get involved with such projects. And if they couldn't, they might end up leaving. It will help with um, bringing in new talent into the organization as well and improving the image of the overall company. And a side effect almost is acceleration. We accelerate the speed of innovation. We accelerate the amount of learning that's happening. <clears throat> and if you think about it, there's research that shows that 70% of people in jobs today are disengaged. They're disengaged at work and they're turning up. They're not really enthusiastic about what they're doing. So we need to give them innovative projects that they can work on. So in eight years, you can see that you're able to balance the scales. You know, the founder of, 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 of this program also had IPO'd a company. He had a multi-billion dollar company, and then he focused his attention on creating new value, which has now added up to $25 billion within eight years. So if you're in a large company, ask yourself, what has your company achieved in terms of new innovation and new, new products to market in the last eight years? <clears throat> And what will actually happen is not only will the cash cow be healthier and be adapting, but we'll be creating new cash cows where future revenue will come. And, and this is really important. And, and I think one of the best examples in the world of this is Richard Branson from the Virgin Group. Right? I think Richard said it best when he said, 
Healthy growth requires a smattering of entrepreneurs who drive new projects and explore new and unexpected directions for business development. Keyword, unexpected. If you let people explore, you will stumble across new opportunities. It's not what the CEO and boardroom can map out 10 years in advance, okay? It doesn't always work like that. And the reason why Virgin is never affected from financial crisis is because it has so many revenue streams. Within the, um, the umbrella of Virgin, they've launched 350 businesses. Almost every single business has been launched by an entrepreneur, one of their own employees, okay? If that doesn't sell your management and they still ask why the hell should we invest in entrepreneurship, what's the ROI? Ask them what's the ROI of survival, right? What, what does it mean for us to have our company, to have our jobs in 10 years from now, given that 70% of the Fortune 500 companies have, have, have disappeared since 1990, and, and that is just happening faster and faster than ever before. Okay, so I'm just going to close with that. My name's Jan Kennedy. Everyone's on Twitter these days, so if you want to follow me, this is what I look like from behind. Thank you.